It was the night before uh, Billy Graham was going to preach at one of his crusades. And one of the evangelists, a man called Leighton Ford, was doing an open air meeting. And this is what's very interesting. Billy Graham was a little bit cheeky. He was a little naughty. And he arrived at this open air meeting in disguise, incognito. And he hid at the back. And as Leighton Ford's preaching, he preached a very sort of uh, profound message. And at the end of the message, just like Billy used to do, he said, Would anyone now like to give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ? If you want to, come forward now publicly. Because Jesus always called people publicly. And Billy was sat at the back, and he noticed there was a young man. And this young man's very moved. He's very sort of taken up with the message. So Billy just shifted up close next to him and sat down next to him and said, What about you, young man? Would you like to go forward and receive the Lord Jesus Christ? And the young man looked at the disguised Billy Graham and said, I do. I really, really do. But I want to wait until tomorrow night. You see, I want the big shot, Billy Graham. I want him to lead me to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Billy said, well, I could lead you right now. No, 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 no. I want Billy Graham himself to lead me to the Lord Jesus Christ. And years later, Leighton Ford and Billy Graham, they're talking about this story. And Leighton said, it is interesting, isn't it? Many people think that evangelism is for the big shots. It's for the Billy Grahams of the world. But if I give you one thing, if there's one thing you take away from this message, please take this with you. Evangelism is not for the big billies, the the big, big Billy Grahams of the world. It's for the average Joes like you and me. So tonight, I've got three headings for you. My first heading is Paul's extravagant affirmation. My second heading is Paul's extravagant claim. And my third and final heading is Paul's extravagant love. Okay, firstly, Paul's extravagant affirmation. Just stoop down to verse 1 with me. It says, I am, not, I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now, what Paul's about to say is so extreme, it's so wild, it's so crazy that he knows that people simply aren't going to believe him. So if you notice, he really overstresses it. He does it three times to say, I'm telling the truth. The first time he says, yes, I'm telling the truth. The second time he says, I am not lying. And then the third time he says, my conscience is bearing me witness. You see, Paul really, really wants to emphasize this thing. I'm telling you the truth. I'm not exaggerating here. Now let's just stop there for a minute and let's remember this. Honesty is a real mark of godliness, is it not? There was a pastor of a church and sadly his car broke down. So he thought, how am I going to get to work? What what do I do? So he caught the bus. And as he got onto the bus, he gave the bus driver a five pound note. And the bus driver gave him 20 pounds back in change. Okay, five pounds, 20 pounds back in change. And the pastor goes to the back of the bus and he's in total turmoil. What do I do? You see, oh, my car's broken down and I could really do with that extra money. And besides, come on, let's think about it. The bus company, they've got lots of money. They're not going to miss 20 pounds. What should I do? Anyway, as he gets off the bus, he looks at the bus driver and he says, excuse me, sir. You gave me 20 pounds extra in change. And the bus driver smiles back at him and says, I know exactly how much change I gave you. I've been listening to your sermons online, and I wanted to know if Christians are really honest. You see, for us as Christians to say something, the world, the people around us need to know when we say something, our word is like giving them a solid bar of gold. For us to tell half a truth, is to tell a lie. And even exaggeration at times can be being economical with the truth. We, we need to make sure we are honest and we bear the name of Christ wherever we go. So take all of that into your mind and then absorb verse 2. It says that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Now, in a moment's time, we're going to see this enormous claim, this most momentous claim that the Apostle Paul has to say. But just remember this. Every time the Apostle Paul thought of his unbelieving brethren, there was a sorrow there. There was a pain. 
There was a, a deep suffering in his heart that just would not go away. Our Lord uses the exact same word in John 16, verse 21, when he's talking about a, a woman giving birth, child labor pains. So in other words, this pain that Paul has for his unbelieving brethren is excruciating. He wears it like a coat, and every day it's tearing him to pieces. Our Lord Jesus Christ had a similar compassion, did he not? It says in the scriptures that he looked out at the crowds and he had compassion on them, for they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus Christ, he wept for the lost. When he was on the cross, he was spat on, he was stripped naked, he was beaten, he was bruised, he had nails through his hands and his feet, his back was lacerated. He died the most terrible death. Why? Because he loved people. Can I ask you a question? Do you love people? D.L. Moody, another evangelist. D.L. Moody was a very interesting man because he was uneducated and he spoke with a slur. And actually, there was other pastors in the town of Chicago that were sort of jealous of D.L. Moody. Why is it this uneducated man sees literally thousands of people come into Christ every year and we don't even see one converse a year? What is this man doing differently? So three pastors said, would it be okay if we spent the day with you, Mr. Moody? And Mr. Moody agreed. Anyway, at the end of the day, uh, Mr. Moody said, would you mind if I took you up to my hotel room? I'd like to show you something. So the pastors agreed. So here they are. They went right to the top of a, of a 10-story building, and they looked out. And Mr. Moody said, just look out now at this window and tell me, what do you see? One of the pastors said, I see children and their parents playing in the park, having a wonderful time. Another of the pastors said, I see great big tall trees bringing praise and glory to the Lord God. Another of the pastors said, I see businessmen rushing, can't wait to get to work. And then one of the pastors turned round and looked at Mr. Moody and noticed there was a tear rolling down his cheek. Mr. Moody, what do you see? I see thousands and thousands of souls that without my Saviour, will be trapped in hell forever. My dear friend, when you look at the crowds, what do you see? Now, please don't misunderstand me. We as Christians are to have the joy of the Lord. Jesus Christ said, let your light shine before all men. And there's nothing more attractive than when a believer realizes I'm redeemed, I'm saved, I have eternal life, and that light shines out. That's what the world needs to see is an attractiveness about us, an inner peace that the Lord has done something remarkable in our lives. But at the same time, we must have this deep sorrow over the lost of those who are perishing in their sin. We've all done it before, haven't we? We've all been a little bit bored, and we've put the TV on, and we've, we hit that plus button. You keep pushing it, you keep pushing it. What channel will you eventually end up on if you keep pushing that button? God TV or, or TBN. And we've all seen the sort of televangelist on the TV, and he's, he's got a face full of Botox, he's got plastic teeth, and he's playing the piano, and he's sort of manipulating the people, and he says, would anyone like to come to Christ tonight? Raise your hand. Five people raise their hands. Okay, play the piano again, Maureen, and then she plays it. Oh, ten people now, and he's, he's really tugging on people's emotions, and we see that. And we cringe and we think, I want nothing to do with that. I don't want that. We don't want to be like that. But what I think has happened now is that the pendulum has swung in the opposite direction. And now we've become so mechanical, so cold, so distant, that we don't even weep over the loss. We don't even think about the lost future. My dear friends, I don't mean to sound harsh to you. I'm on the same team as you. I struggle with these things too. But if we don't have this unceasing anguish, we should pray for it. There's, there's nothing that we can do in ourselves to get this. We, we can't psych ourselves up to it. Listening to a sermon won't do it. Listening uh, to spiritual songs, that won't do it. No, this is a deep abiding work of God. And if we don't have it, we need to ask the Lord God to soften our hearts. Because the Bible says he will not withhold any good gift from his children. Okay, secondly, uh, Paul's extravagant claim. Just dwell on verse 3 with me. It says, For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ 
for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now we're going to appreciate the great lengths that Paul went to to say, I am not lying. Now we're going to see this this great big claim that the Apostle Paul is saying. What is he saying? He's saying he is willing to give up his salvation for those same people who wanted him dead. Do you remember that they made a pact about the Apostle Paul? They said, we will not eat another meal until we have the Apostle Paul's head. And yet Paul was willing to say, I will lay down my salvation. I'll give up my salvation for those same people who are trying to kill me. Paul was prepared to be accursed. I wonder if there's anyone in the room today who's got that wonderful King James version in front of you. You've got a word there if you've got the King James version, and it's that word anathema. What does that word anathema mean? It means I'll go to hell permanently, eternally, if they will go to heaven. I'll be divorced from the bride of Christ if they will become married to God. I will make my bed in Sheol if they will find rest in the Lord. I'll be plunged into the lake of fire if they will drink of the river of life. I will be cut off from Christ if they will be grafted in to that one true vine. And it's important to remember here that Paul is speaking hypothetically. He's just labored it in, in chapter 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Paul believed once saved, always saved. Paul said, he who has started the good work in you will ensure that it is completed. Jesus said, none shall pluck them out of my hand. And it's an insult for us to say that we can lose our salvation because God has a very strong hand. And once he gets hold of you, he does not let go. But Paul rather He's speaking from the depths of love. And when love speaks, it's not logic, it's not reason. It's the heart that speaks. And you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Is that anyone in the room today who can shyly raise their hand and say, I- I've fallen in love before? No, none of you have been in love. Okay, <laughs> miserable congregation here, okay. But when we're in love, we do say irrational things, don't we? We say silly things. I remember my wife, Emma, when we were dating... I said to her, can you surf? And she said, yes, I was trained by a professional surfer. And what she meant is I'd only been done one class. So we, we, buy, we buy a surfboard, we go out together, and I'm there catching waves, and my wife's just sort of bobbing around on the, on the ocean. We say things, don't we? We speak irrationally when we're in love. Paul's head is saying, no, no, this is impossible. But his heart is saying, if only. If only there was something I could do about it. Let me be transparent with you right now. I'm an evangelist. If you like, my job is to introduce people to God. And yet, I'm not there yet. I can't say, like the Apostle Paul said, I'd be willing to be accursed for my own brethren. I can't say like Moses said. Do you remember when Moses went to the top of Mount Sinai? And he got the Ten Commandments there. And as he came down to the bottom, what were the people doing? They'd built a big gold calf, idolatry. And Moses was furious. He slammed the Ten Commandments down. Moses was angry, but God was even more angry. And what did Moses do? He interceded with the people. He interceded for them and said, Lord, if you will not forgive this people, blot out my name from the book of life. I can't say like Moses, I can't say like Paul. Often, at times, I'm so focused on self-preservation. And we've talked about COVID-19 a little bit tonight. If there was anything that showed that in my heart more than anything, it was COVID-19. It showed me how selfish I am, how self-obsessed I am, how much I'm trying to protect myself. But until we at least feel pity for the lost, we'll never see the urgency. We'll always choose comfort and ease over reaching them. If I asked you, who is the group of people you really struggle to share the gospel with, who would you say? Perhaps you'd say, I I struggle to share the gospel with Muslims. Maybe you'd say Catholics. Maybe it's that brother or sister or that, that grandparent or that family member who's just so hardened. Do you know who mine is? I really struggle to share the gospel with my neighbors. I talked about Matthew Gray before. We actually used to live on the same street as Jira Baptist. And as the evangelist, me and Matthew said, it's time for us to, to reach the streets. We want to reach the people around us. So let's do some door-to-door work. And when it came to, to reaching the people of my street, I was going along, knocking on doors. 
And then I came up to my neighbours. And I said, Matthew, could you just come over here for a minute? What's up, Joe? Matthew, would you mind just uh, knocking on my neighbour's door? Why, Joe? Why, why do you want me to do that? You've done all the rest of the street. What, what's wrong? Well, Matthew, me and Emma had a bit of a Barney last night. I feel like if I just knock on the door and say, hey, um, do you want to come to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know who I am. You, they're going to say, I heard all the things you were saying to your wife last night. You're a hypocrite. I really do struggle to, to reach my neighbours. Roger Carswell, a friend of Vinnie and mine, he has a challenge and he says this. Now, insert your name here, whoever you are. Imagine I come and, and knock on your neighbour's door. And I say to them, Joe Bloggs, Mary Jane. Imagine uh, I, I say to them, what is it they believe? They go to church every Sunday. They believe in God. What is it they believe about the Bible? Would they be able to say about the death, the resurrection? Would they be able to give a solid answer of what the gospel is? Or would they not have a clue about what we believe? There's a poem. I don't know who it was written by, but I find it very challenging. And it's all about reaching our neighbours. You lived next door to me for years. We shared our dreams, our joys and tears. A friend to me you were indeed, a friend who helped me when in need. My faith in you was strong and sure. We had such trust as should endure. No spats between us ever rose. Our friends were alike and so our foes. What a sadness then, my friend, to find that after all, you weren't so kind. The day my life on earth did end, I found you weren't a faithful friend. For all those years we spent on earth, you never spoke of second birth. You never spoke of my lost soul and of the Christ who'd make me whole. So I plead today from hell's cruel fire and tell you now my last desire. You cannot do a thing for me. No words today will set me free. But do not err, my friend, again. Do all you can for the souls of men. Plead with them now, quite earnestly, lest they be cast in hell with me. Okay, thirdly, Paul's extravagant love. Now, because Paul was, was prepared to be damned for his kinsmen, you're going to see right now that nothing, literally nothing, would stop him from trying to reach them. If you've got a Bible in front of you, would you mind just turning to 2 Corinthians chapter 11 with me? Second Corinthians 11, and we're going to read verses 25 down to 31. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. For a night and a day I was adrift at the sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is made to fall? And I am not indignant. If I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. The God and Father of the Lord Jesus, he who is blessed forever, knows that I am not lying. Charles Spurgeon, when he was commenting on, on this particular passage, said, When once your heart is brought to this pitch of agony, you'll soon see them saved. And Paul was willing to, to lose absolutely everything to win the people of Israel for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you get to that point where you're actually willing to be accursed, that's the point 
when you'll start living sacrificially. That's the point when you will do whatever it takes, no matter how much it costs you, no matter what reaction you get, you'll go to great lengths to try and win souls for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now imagine, imagine if just 20 people in Southport had something which resembled the Apostle Paul's heart. If just 10 people in Southport had something for this burden for the lost, the town would never be the same again. It would be turned upside down. We wouldn't recognize it. You see, the Apostle Paul, do you remember when he, he, he got stoned to death? He, he basically nearly died. And what does it say in the scripture? What happened? What did he do the next day? The next day, he marched back into the same place with the same people who killed him and preached the gospel. The Bible says we, we're being killed all day long and he was willing to keep going back no matter what flack, no matter what happened to him. He kept going on, kept laboring on. When we get to heaven, our worship in heaven will be much greater than any worship we have down here. When we get to heaven, our fellowship will be much sweeter. There'll be no arguments in heaven. It'll be much sweeter than any fellowship we have down here. When we get to heaven, we will have a greater joy, a greater love, a greater worship. Everything will be better in heaven. But there's one thing in heaven we cannot do. And what is that? Evangelism. We cannot reach the lost anymore. That window of opportunity will be shut and it will never open again. In a hundred years' time, pretty much all of us will be forgotten, won't we? But if we lead a sinner to Christ, we'll share all of eternity with them. Daniel 12, verse 3 says, Those who turn many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. So as I wrap all of this up, how do we apply it? We're not all street preachers, are we? We're not all Billy Grahams, are we? Some of us are incredibly shy. Some of us get really nervous just to ask someone for the time. Sometimes when I'm lost in a neighborhood and I'm really lost, I'd rather just drive around lost than just wind down my window and say, excuse me, could you tell me where it is? Some of us struggle with that. We get shy, don't we? So what can we do? What's a realistic way of sharing the gospel for everyone? Well, this is something I'd like to call the, the shy method of evangelism. And again, it's inspired by my friend Roger Carswell. He's got this idea of losing tracks, losing Christian leaflets. Ecclesiastes 6 verse 11 says this, In the morning, sow your seed, and in the evening, do not withhold your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, either this or that, or whether both alike will be good. And it's this idea that we're all sort of spiritual farmers, just like a farmer goes out with a big bag of seed and he scatters it on the ground, not knowing which will do well, what will grow. So we should be like spiritual farmers. We go out with a big bag of tracks and everywhere we go, we try and drop gospel seeds. So you sit on the bus and as you leave the bus, you just leave a, a little Christian leaflet. You go into Costa and you just put a, a tract on the table at Costa. You, you buy a book from the library. You read the book, hopefully. You put the tract in it, and then you put it back. Roger Carswell's really cheeky. He actually gets those prepaid envelopes. He puts the tract in it, and then he posts it back to the people who sent it. And then there are other ways as well. You know, we, we can go up to the cashier, that person who you, who you see at Sainsbury's every week, and say, sorry, could I just give you a little Christian leaflet here? Or the person you get petrol from, sorry, can I, can I just leave you a Christian leaflet? I've never been rejected yet. Often, you might get a little bit of a funny look, but often you get a smile and they say, thank you very much. Easter's coming up soon, isn't it? Why don't you buy your neighbors an Easter egg and put a Christian booklet in or a Christian book and say, can I just give you that? that this is the most important thing to me. Could I just give you that? You see, these things, they're not really that hard to do, are they? It doesn't require, you know, a lot of boldness. It just requires a little bit of effort and a little bit of thought. And how wonderful would it be when you get to heaven, you meet someone and they say, I was sat in Costa in Southport and I read a Christian leaflet, and that leaflet told me that there was a Savior who died on a cross for my sins, and that day I met the Lord Jesus. And you think, I left that leaflet there in Costa. For all of eternity, you're going to have a special relationship with this person, aren't you? We just need to be ready to do these things. And I suppose, it, what am I trying to drive home in this message? I'm saying, are we desperate to win souls? Are we desperate to see souls saved?
Let me tell you about a man who really was desperate to see souls saved. John Harper was a Scottish pastor who was on the Titanic when it sank. And uh, he'd been invited to preach at D.L. Moody's church in Chicago. So he thought, you know what? I'm going to take my daughter and let's go on the most luxurious ship in the world, the Titanic. Let's have a bit of an adventure. Survivors of the Titanic remember seeing John Harper. Wherever he went, he'd have a light about him, a joy, a kindness. He always had a kind word to say to people. But on April the 15th, 1912, John Harper tucked his daughter into bed and read the Bible just like he did night after night. And at 11.40 that night, the unsinkable ship hit an iceberg, and people quickly realized they were doomed. So John Harper, he picked up his daughter, he wrapped her in a blanket, and he went to lifeboat to number 11 and said, Please, promise me you'll take good care of my daughter. He gave her a kiss, realizing this is probably the last time I shall ever see her again. He then took off his life jacket and he gave it to another person. He was literally laying down his life for another. And then again, survivors say they remember seeing him walk up to the top deck, kneeling down and praying with those scared passengers, praying that they would receive the forgiveness of sins that only Christ can offer. And then at 2.40, the Titanic sunk beneath the Atlantic Ocean leaving thousands of souls fighting for their lives. But even the icy cold waters did not stop John Harper from urging sinners to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Four years later, at a Christian meeting in Hamilton in Canada, a man stood up and said this, I am a survivor of the Titanic, and I was there on that fearful night, holding on to a piece of shipwreck, when a man swam up to me and said, Sir, are you saved? And I said to him, I am not. So he cried out, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And then the current took him away. About an hour later, again, the current took him back, and the man said to him, Sir, sir are you now saved? And I said to him, I can honestly say, Still, I am not saved. And the man cried even louder, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And then moments later, that man disappeared beneath the waters. So here I was, totally alone, with two miles of water beneath me. And there, I believed. I am John Harper's last convert. My dear friends, if I asked you the same question that John Harper asked, are you saved yet? Have you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? Because did you know this? You and I are also on the Titanic. It's called planet Earth. And this ship is going down and down. And I need to know that when you are plunged into the icy cold waters of death, will you go to heaven or hell? Perhaps you didn't know this, but in Liverpool, they had a ferry office called the White Star Ferry Office. And outside this ferry office, they put this big, huge board. And on the board was two categories, two lists. One said those who are known to be saved and those who are known to be lost. And my dear friends, in life, there are only two categories. It's not rich or poor. It's not those who are from the north or from the south. It's those who are known to be lost and those who are known to be saved. And only you know which category you're in. If you know you're in the category of knowing that you are lost, I plead with you right now, come to the one, who, the one who died on the cross for your sins. Believe on the one who said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly, but then I take it up again. The one who really was plunged into death itself, but then rose from the dead on the third day. The one who took all of our sin, all of our rubbish, all of our ugliness, all the skeletons in our closet, because we've all done shameful things that no one sees, but God sees. And that Savior died on that cross, enduring the agony of that cross, the darkness of that cross, suffering there, so that any man, any woman who cries out to him can know that they are forgiven and saved. Why do you put it off? Why do you reject this loving Savior? I plead with you, if you know you are known to be lost, whatever, your, whatever words are in your heart now, cry out to him and ask him to save you. 
because he will not turn you away.